Hello and welcome back. So in the previous video, uh, we talked about Cauchy's integral theorem. And we saw that if uh, Wc uh, is a complex analytic function defined over a simply connected region of the complex plane, and C is some uh, simple closed contour, then the integral of, of Wz over the contour uh, vanishes. Or in other words, um, if Wz is analytic, um, inside uh, contour C and over the contour C. So for instance, this is the region that we're talking about, and W is analytic inside this region and on the contour C. Then the integral of Wz over this contour is 0. And this is the Cauchy integral theorem. Um, so in this particular video, Let's work with uh, some very simple examples to uh, explicitly see how one can go about calculating this integral, this contour integral in certain cases. Uh, and specifically uh, with two things in mind. So our explicit evaluation, through our explicit evaluation, we want to sort of understand two things a little better. First, uh, the role of analyticity uh, especially in the context of Cauchy's integral theorem. So analyticity. And second, uh, the role that the choice of contour C uh, plays in, uh, in, in, in the final result or in the evaluation of the integral. So the choice of C of the contour C. Uh, so, so let's work with a couple of examples. Uh, where we can explicitly evaluate the integral, and then we sort of get back to these uh, these two issues uh, as we sort of go along. So, as a first example, uh, let's consider the function w z equals z, uh, and let's evaluate its integral over a contour, a simple contour, which we can take to be uh, a square loop in the complex plane. So, let's say this is our contour. So this is a square centered at the uh, origin of the complex plane. This is the real part of the uh, complex plane. Uh, let's just label it with x. And this is the imaginary part, label it as y. Um, uh, and uh, let's take the limits of the square region to be from x equals minus 1 to, uh, to x equals 1 comma 0 along the x direction. And then likewise, uh, uh, y equals minus 1 to y equals plus 1 along the y-axis. So this is our sort of contour. Uh, we also need to associate a sense with the contour, either how will we sort of uh, move along the contour. And for that, let's assume that we'll move in the counterclockwise direction, so in this manner. Right. So uh, given this function, our task is to evaluate the integral of Wz over the contour. So we just call this entire contour C. So we want to evaluate Wz over this contour. Now, as you may remember from uh, some of our previous discussion, wz equal to z, or rather the function z, is complex analytic. And I'll put a link to the video where we talked about this. So, so, so uh, and, 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 and if you look at this, this particular region of space, uh, the contour that we've chosen is fairly simple. It doesn't have any self-intersections. Uh, there's nothing else that seems to be uh, sort of going on which could complicate things. So it's a fairly simple uh, region of space we're considering. Uh, so we would expect the Cauchy's integral theorem to work uh, in this region. Let's just see uh, whether that is the case by explicitly evaluating this integral. Now, how should we go about evaluating the integral? Uh, so if you recall uh, our discussion on Riemann, uh, sort of Riemann sum interpretation of the complex integral, the basic idea is very similar to that of a real uh, uh, of, the, of the integration of one uh, of a function of one real variable, wherein as we move along the contour, uh, sort of let's say we move along the contour from here to here, what we're doing is uh, I'll just take this part of the contour and zoom it in here. Here, so, so this is a straight line segment in this form. So as we move along the contour, uh, we sort of break it down into infinitesimal sections. And at each of these infinitesimal sections, for instance here, we evaluate wz, uh, which is a complex number. And then 
let us assume that the length of these infinitesimal segment is some uh, complex number dz. So we evaluate wz uh, and this is the point z. So this point is the complex number z. So at z, we evaluate wz and multiply it, uh, multiply this complex number wz with the infinitesimal complex number dz and then sum this as we move along the contour. So we sum, sum wz dz from here uh, with the wz dz from here and so on as we move along the contour. That's the basic idea behind the contour integral. So in order to calculate this integral, uh, we'll do, we, first we need to understand, first we need to take, uh, first we need to figure out what wz is at different points along the contour. And then, uh, because of the form of the contour, we can actually simplify uh, e simplify the sort of integration by splitting this contour into four different paths. So as a first path, we take the path that is along the y parallel to the y-axis, which goes from y equals minus 1 to y equals plus 1. So we can take this as our first path. And the reason why we can choose this, uh, we, we sort of uh, uh, break this entire contour into uh, four parts is because along, for instance, along this path, you see that only y varies where x is constant. Similarly, along this path, as we move along this path, only x varies and y is constant at 1. And likewise for this and this path. So there's a natural sort of uh, dissection that we can do of this contour into four parts. So first path is here, second we can refer to this part, third to this part and fourth to this part. And so in effect, what we're saying is that in order to evaluate this contour integral, uh, we can evaluate the integral over part one plus part two plus part three plus part four. And if you recall some of the rules of uh, complex integrals that we've talked about before, you'll see that we can, uh, I'll put a link to the video again, you'll see that it's, it's perfectly okay to sort of take a long contour and split it into different parts and then sum the integrals over each of these parts. Uh, so now how do we evaluate the integral along each of these parts? So let's say we talk about path one here, okay? Uh, so first of all, we need to find a representation for z. Now, since this is a square contour, it's more convenient to think of z in terms of its Cartesian representation. So for instance, at any point on this uh, contour, whether it's here or it's here, uh, let's refer to the complex number z uh, with its x-coordinate and with its y-coordinate. So for instance, uh, the complex number in terms, in, in, in uh, the, the, the complex number z, uh, if, if you draw it as a vector, then it will be a vector starting from the origin and going all the way to the complex number z here. In terms of its Cartesian representation, z can be written in the form x plus i y. So it's x component plus i y component. And the value of the function at this point z is actually just z because the function is wz equals z. So, so with that, we have a representation for z or wz, which is this. What we then need is, along this path, we need to calculate, so I'll just zoom this path again, so let's say we have z here, and now we need a represent, representation for the infinitesimal segment dz. So at any point z here, if we move a small distance along the contour, the only element that we're changing is y and not x. In fact, with this Cartesian representation, uh, if we apply this Cartesian represent, representation along path 1, then wz along path 1, or let's just write, the, write 1 here, is actually of the form x equals 1 plus i y. So at in the, the, the point z here is actually 1 plus i y because the x coordinate is always fixed at its value 1, and it's only y that's varying. So w along, wz along path 1 is just of the form 1 plus i y. Similarly, dz, the infinitesimal segment along this path, as we move along this path, would show no variation in x, but only a variation in y. And so dz can be obtained by just taking the differential of this equation. Uh, by, so we vary, uh, so, so a change in dz is nothing but i times a change in dy. So, and one way to obtain this is simply to differentiate this expression with respect to y. So dz, uh, differentiating z with respect to y will just give us i, and so dz is i times dy, which follows from here. So along path 1, uh, if we are to evaluate the integral along path 1 of wz dz, is actually of the form w is 1 plus i y and dz is i times dy and the, 
and the limits of the integral are from y equals minus 1 to plus 1 so y equals minus 1 to y equals uh, plus 1 so we see that this uh, contour integral uh, along let's say path 1 we've been able to reduce it to just an integration over a function of one real variable which happens to be y in this case with the limits of the integration also well defined from y equals minus 1 to y equals plus 1 so all we now have to do is evaluate this integral um, so let's do that here so this has two parts uh, one is the term coming from 1 times i dy so the so the first first part of the integral is i times dy integrating from minus 1 to 1 and the second part is uh, i times y times i times dy which is i square times y dy from minus 1 to 1 now we know that i square is minus 1 and it's just a constant and again uh, from the rules of complex integration we can take a constant outside the integral sign so this is just minus here this particular integral is again it has a constant i and then the integral of dy is just y with limits 1 going from minus 1 to 1 so that will just give us a factor of 2 here 2 times i minus from here the integral will be half of y square with limits of integration minus 1 to 1 so when we plug in the expression for 1 here so we'll have 1 square minus minus 1 square divide by 2 and this will just be 0 so, so this part of the integral is just vanishes and it's just 0 under the limits that we have defined and so the overall value of this integral is nothing but 2i so this is 2i so we have been able to explicitly evaluate the value of the integral along path 1 and uh, just so that we remember I just write down this value here so the value is 2i along this path in the same way we can evaluate the integral along other, along the other other uh, three paths so for instance along path 2 uh, we now see that along path 2 it's x the x component of z varies whereas the y component is fixed at 1 and so the expression for wz will be uh, x plus i times 1 okay so wz will be x plus i1 and this is also what z will be uh, at any point here right z will have its x coordinate fixed and only uh, there's there's only a variation uh, sorry z will have its y coordinate fixed and there's only a variation in the x coordinate so z is x plus i1 because wz is z and therefore the variation in z dz is simply a variation in x dx so this dz is nothing but dx so again we have sort of converted this integral into a one integral of a function of one real, real variable since we are moving along this path in a counterclockwise direction the limits of integration as we go from here to here is actually x equals plus 1 to minus 1 so here the limit is from plus 1 to minus 1 okay and just like before we can explicitly evaluate this integral um, so the first term will give us x dx from 1 to minus 1 and the second part will be i times dx i times dx from 1 to minus 1 as before this integral will vanish whereas from here we get i times minus 1 minus 1 which is minus 2i so the value of this integral will be minus of 2i so I'll just write it down here so this is minus 2i So in the same way, we can evaluate the integral along path 3 now. And along path 3, uh, we again find that x is constant, whereas y varies. So this is, so the value of x is fixed at minus 1. So it's minus 1 plus i times y. dz, as before, will be i times dy. And the limits of integration will be from y equals plus 1 to y equals minus 1. So 2 minus 1. So, so again, uh, the integral of the, the term i times y times i times dy will vanish. The only, uh, only, only, uh, int uh, the, the, the only finite term that we get will be from the term from the integral of minus i times dy. So let's write that down here. Minus i times dy from 1 to minus 1. This will be minus i minus 1 minus 1, which is 2i. 
absolute. So the value of this integral will be 2i. So now this path, it's 2i. And now uh, all we need to do is evaluate the value of the integral along path 4. And along path 4, as we see that y is again fixed, whereas x varies. So it's x and y is fixed at its value of minus 1 times dx and x goes from minus 1 to 1. Again, the integral of x dx uh, over this limit minus 1 to 1 will vanish. And all we are left with is the integral of minus i times dx from minus 1 to 1, which will be minus i uh, 1 minus uh, minus 1, which is minus 2i. So the integral along this path will be minus of 2i. So we, so we have evaluated uh, the integral along each of these paths. And when we sum them up, we find that along path 1, it's 2i. Along path 2, it's minus 2i. Along path 3, it's 2i. And along path 4, it's minus 2i. And the net result is that this integration, this integral vanishes. And this is exactly what we'll expect from Cauchy's integral theorem, because wz is analytic in this entire region. Uh, so its closed contour integral over this particular contour vanishes. So, uh, so this is uh, an explicit evaluation of the contour integral, and it agrees with our uh, sort of uh, uh, agrees with our well, what we expect from Cauchy's integral theorem. But what still remains to be uh, uh, sort of studied a little bit more is what did the role of this? Uh, what did the role, uh, or, or is there any role that the contour, the choice of the contour, plays in the final value, final value of this integral? Uh, in order to investigate that a little further, uh, let's keep the function as w z equals z, and let's just change the contour and see what happens, just to quickly evaluate another integral, uh, which we can actually evaluate explicitly. So uh, as a second example, uh, let's change the contour from a, circle, from a square to a circle, which is centered at the origin. So let's take this to be our contour now. Uh, again, let's choose the anti-clockwise sense of uh, propagation on the circle. Um, let the circle have radius r. And so the equation of the circle, which we have talked about before, like uh, one way to represent the equation of a circle in the complex plane uh, for a circle whose radius is r is actually r e to the power of i theta, where theta is the angle it makes with respect to the x-axis. Um, so, so that's our contour now. And again, the function is w z equals z. Now, uh, since we are moving along the circle, this time it makes uh, more sense and it's more convenient to actually work with the polar representation of the complex variable z, or the complex function wz. Uh, and the polar representation in this case would be uh, of the form, a polar representation in general uh, of, of uh, z is actually of the form mod of z times e to the power of i phi, where phi is the angle the complex number z makes with respect to the x-axis, and mod z is the length of the vector from the origin to the complex number z. However, since we are moving along the circle, uh, and we want to calculate the value of the function at points on the circle and multiply it by infinitesimal lengths along the circle, on, the, on, the, on this particular circle, the value of the complex number, any complex number z that we choose, will actually be so on the circle, uh, w on the circle will be will have a it will have a magnitude r, and the angle will be simply the the angle that uh, th this vector r makes with the x-axis. So it's r e to the power of i theta, which is exactly what the equation for the circle is. So as we move along the circle, the complex number z, the complex number z, or rather the function w z, actually uh, uh, can, can be represented by this, this particular equation. Um, so this is w z on the circle. And again, uh, since w z is actually equal to z, so this is also the expression for z. So why we are sort of emphasizing this point is because given that w z uh, uh, is equal to z and both of them satisfy this equation, uh, this equation coincides with the equation for the circle, and therefore the infinitesimal segments dz along the circle can actually be obtained from an expression for z itself. So since z on the circle is again re to the power of i theta, 
the variations in z as we move along the circle are simply variations in z due to variations in the angle theta and they can be obtained by differentiating and because r is fixed along the circle r is the radius of the circle which is fixed and so these infinitesimal lengths dz the complex number dz can be obtained by simply differentiating this expression with respect to theta and with the result that we find that dz is actually uh, i sort of is a constant which comes out from this exponential i r e to the power of i theta d theta that's what dz will evaluate to uh, so overall we can now evaluate this integral w z d z as w z is uh, r e to the power of i theta d z is i r e to the power of i theta d theta and here theta goes from 0 to 2 pi that's one choice we can make so theta goes from 0 to 2 pi and again you see that uh, just just as uh, with our previous example we have been able to recast this contour integral in uh, in terms of just an integration over one variable which is theta in this case with the limits of integration from 0 to 2 pi and again this integral can be explicitly evaluated so i r square is just a constant and so all we want to do is evaluate this e to the power of 2 i theta d theta now e to the power 2 i theta can be decomposed into cosine 2 theta plus i times sine 2 theta so this integral is i r square integral from 0 to 2 pi cosine 2 theta d theta uh, plus i times 0 to 2 pi sine 2 theta d theta and both of these integrals as we know would vanish so this overall is 0 with the result that the value of this integral is i r square times 0 which is just 0 so as before uh, even though this time we are, we are working with a circular contour uh, we, we were able to explicitly evaluate the integral of wz over this contour and we find that the result is 0 and again this agrees with Cauchy's integral theorem uh, because wz is analytic and this is again a simple contour uh, so, so the result is 0 uh, notice that in the evaluation of this integral there was a factor i which came all the way down to here until uh, the fact that we ended up multiplying it with 0 to obtain a 0 but this hints at something very interesting which is that this result is independent of the size of the circle so in the previous example we specifically chose a square loop with uh, which, which went from x equals minus 1 to x equals plus 1 and one could question what will happen if we change the size of the square loop but as we see from this example it actually wouldn't matter at all the size of the loop the radius of the circle doesn't matter because the end result is just just happens to be 0 uh, which also means that uh, we can uh, if we are given a large circle we can think of shrinking the circle and working with a contour which looks like this shrinking it further shrinking it further or expanding the circle or we can deform the circle into a square all of these all of these contours will yield the same result and in fact the circle need not even be centered at the origin uh, so these ideas are very interesting uh, and, the, and and sort of uh, this, this process of changing the contour is called deformation of a contour uh, and sometimes if you're given a practical problem with a very complicated looking contour uh, it's actually possible in, in some cases and convenient to actually deform the contour into something that we can explicitly evaluate or parameterize um, so, uh, so we'll explore these ideas in future videos um, but one, one other thing that sort of uh, one sort of terminology which uh, which we haven't yet talked about is the way we have evaluated this integral so far is called parametric evaluation of the integral uh, the reason it's called uh, parametric evaluation is because in both the cases we have been able to uh, parameterize the curve a square or a circle uh, in, in, uh, parameterize it in terms of a variable such that the contour integral has been converted into a, uh, an integral of just one uh, uh, just a function of one real variable over, uh, over, over one parameter so it's sometimes called parametric evaluation of integrals so uh, so hopefully this has given some intuition that the choice of the contour uh, doesn't make a difference in, to, uh, in so far as the value of the integral of an analytic function is concerned but so far we have not yet uh, studied the role of analyticity itself so so let's quickly work out another example 
uh, to, to see what, hap what happens if the function wz that we're working with is not, an is not analytic, and then what happens to the evaluation of the integral. So we'll just make a simple change. Instead of working with wz equals z, let's work with wz equals z bar, which is the conjugate of z. And again, uh, for a contour, let's stick with the circular contour that we just worked out with, worked out uh, our, our previous example. Uh, so here again, uh, we just take a circular contour uh, with radius r centered at the origin. So c is r e to the power i theta. The only change we have made is the function wz, which is z bar. So on the circle, the value of wz uh, will be given by z bar uh, on the circle. Now z, as before, uh, can be represented in polar form as r e to the power of i theta. <clears throat> and therefore z bar, which is the conjugate of z, is nothing but r e to the power of minus i theta on the circle. Now, we need another thing, which is dz, the infinitesimal segments on the circle. They have to be obtained from the expression from z, not from the expression for z bar, because, uh, because at any point on the circle, z is given by this. And so any tiny infinitesimal change as we move along the contour should be obtained as a differential over z, uh, and not a differential over the function. So dz is, as before, simply i r e to the power of i theta d theta. And so evaluating this integral, the contour integral over this circle, is actually uh, can, can, can be written in the form wz z bar, which is r e to the minus i theta, times dz, which is i r e to the power of i theta d theta. And again, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. Now notice in this case, the factor e to the power of minus i theta coming from z bar cancels the factor e to the power of i theta, which comes from dz. And so this uh, integral, uh, which I just write it down here, this integral is nothing but i r squared, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta, which is, this integral is evaluates to just 2 pi, so it's uh, 2 pi i r square. So notice one thing, that this integral is not 0. Uh, now wc equals z bar is not an analytic function either. So it's, it's, it's OK, it's, it's perfectly possible that for non-analytical function, the result of the integral is finite and is not uh, 0, as, as, as would be the case if wz were an analytic function. Um, but there's another very interesting thing that comes out of this result, which is if we express this answer in the form i, uh, 2i, 2i times pi r square, we notice that the result is actually 2i times the area enclosed by the contour. This is a circular contour uh, with a circle with radius r. So the area inside this, uh, this, this contour is pi r square. And so the integral of uh, z bar dz over this contour actually comes out to be 2i times the area enclosed by the contour. And in fact, this is a general result which works for whenever we try to evaluate the, the integral of z bar over a closed contour. Uh, for instance, if you try this out with the square loop that we worked on in the previous example, you'll again get 2i times the area enclosed inside the square region. And this, uh, this, this also points at another very important uh, uh, feature, which is, uh, in general, uh, if the function wz is not analytic, the result of the integral will depend upon the choice of the contour. And that's because the area <coughs> enclosed by the contour will in general depend upon the kind of contour that we've cho chosen. Um, and, and that explicitly comes out in the evaluation of this integral. So, uh, so again, uh, so we looked at these two aspects, like both the choice of contour and of analyticity, and there's an interesting interplay between these features. For a non-analytic function, uh, the result of the integral actually, in general, will depend upon the choice of the contour c. For an analytic function, uh, the, the, the result of the integral will actually be independent of the choice of the contour, as long as we are working with working in a simply connected region and with simple contours, uh, 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 the, 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 the result of an integral of an analytic function will actually just evaluate to zero over a closed contour. Um, so hopefully these examples helps us build some intuition about contour integrals, about the different parts of the Cauchy's integral theorem. Uh, and in the next part of the video, we'll work with more examples uh, to sort of re-establish some of these ideas and to also explore some newer ideas which come about in this study. So uh, hope to see you soon there again. Thanks for watching.